Welcome to Lunch with Tech Leaders, where we have engaging conversations about software development and cloud engineering with industry leaders and subject matter experts. These episodes are created by the Great Lakes Tech Leaders, an online community of technology practitioners. Please come join the conversation by visiting gltl.rbn.ai. Again, that's gltl.rbn.ai. Now strap in, because we're deploying to production in three, two, one. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the latest episode of Lunch with Tech Leaders. My name is Adam Oberhausen. I'm the Vice President of Customer Solutions with Right Brain Networks, and I'm your host for today. Joining me today, as always, is my friend and comrade, uh, software and data consultant, Mr. Tom Kowalski. Say hi, Tom. Hello. And uh, joining me today is our, our co-host and uh, business technology consultant, Joe Coleman. Give a quick shout out, Joe, and let the let the fans know what you're here to do. <laughs> hey there, Adam. Thank you for the great intro, as always. Uh, if any of you folks listening in have any questions at all or want a topic covered uh, during the conversation, feel free to throw it in the chat um, in this channel, and I'll make sure to uh, jump in and make sure it gets covered. So thank you so much. And uh, returning co-host and subject matter expert, friend of the show, lifelong friend, uh, Nicole Anderson. Hey, thanks for having me again. Great to be here. Yeah. So today we're going to talk about, uh, it's going to be a two-parter. So I'm going to, we're going to focus on project estimates today. So it, it does tie into like estimates for specific tasks, but really the, the, the topic is like, you know, you've got a big epic or you got a big project. How do you actually go about estimating it? What are some of the common pitfalls? Nicole's been doing product management for many years. Um, so I think she's going to have a great perspective on how how do we come up with these estimates. So yeah, I'll, I guess I'll just you know you excited to talk about this, Tom? Or this- yeah, I, I always am. Previously dabbled on the topic, but I'm very very intrigued by it. Right, especially trying to to get it down to like a science, which is you know everyone says it's kind of impossible, but you know the the closer yeah. you can get the the better. So yeah, I'd love to hear. Uh, Nicole's perspective on it. We've talked before, but you know, she's got some new experiences. So yeah, let's, uh, let's dive in. Yeah. Let me, let me start with a few hot takes and, uh, see what happens. Cause I, the research for the show I think was very interesting for me in that most estimates for software development are lies primarily because they are engineered backwards from a predetermined end date. So the CEO wakes up in the morning and he says, I want to launch the new platform in Q2, right? And there's no, he has, there's no science behind it. It just feels like, well, that's, you know, six months. You can do almost anything in six months. And so then that gets fed down the organizational, you know, the hierarchy. And then ultimately, so then the product managers and delivery teams basically start fabricating, you know, this make-believe storybook ending that ends up with some arbitrary date resulting in the launch of said new feature. So that was the big reveal. That's my first hot take. Nicole, what's your response to that? It's definitely happened. I I mean, you're not wrong. I I think if you have to do estimates, which most companies will make you do, I think the first step is putting the estimates in the hands of the engineering team you know, to, to provide them. Obviously, they're also guessing. We know that too. Everyone's guessing. But at least let them be the source of that information versus it coming from the top down. I, I know that's not always possible, but if you have to do estimates, yeah, that would be my my recommendation or suggestion to, you know, to not, not do it in the way that you described, but certainly happens. <laughs> mm-hmm. When you say not do estimates, who, who doesn't do estimates? I feel like everyone, you know, wants to know when that's going to come up. Yeah, I, that's why I said it's not realistic, but, you know, mm. ideally you want to have like a projection or a direction, but the exact dates are guesswork, as we all know. So mm-hmm. I, I think it's kind of unavoidable, though, in most companies um, where they want to have timelines and release schedules and you're working with other departments, you need to coordinate. So you need to have some target. So, yeah, like I said, I think it's unavoidable, but 
if we have to do them, I would prefer to get my estimates from the team that's closest to the people who will be building it. And then, you know, knowing that they're also just making their best guess and then constantly updating that as we get closer and closer to and learning more information. And it, there's so many different ways that you can do it, but um, I mean, we can get into that. Obviously, but. I'm not sure how I want to approach this, but like before I get to the big unveil of what Ooh. I learned about project estimation, but like I'm so here to learn really, too because I feel like no one is an expert. Like you said, it's all guesswork. So I, I'm curious to see yeah. what how everyone else does it. So the way I the research I did was like you want your estimates to be. Um, you know, there's there is an accuracy factor in your estimates, and then the precision factor in your estimates. Um, so when you when you have a complex task, you want to find how long you think it's going to take you to do. Basically, you would have to, you know, add up what you how long you think it's going to take to do all these tasks, and then you create what's called a um, a work breakdown structure. So it's just like a tree, right? You've got like a task. And then there's subtasks, and then there's sub subtasks, right? And you add oh, up story mapping, or yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know you add up all these tasks, and you and you get what you think is gonna, you know, your mean completion time for the project. Sounds pretty straightforward, but the reality is that as as humans, we're not able to. We miss about fifty percent of the subtask on average, right? So like mm -hmm. that, so. So you can account for that by putting in a fudge factor, I call it a um, padding factor, into your estimate. So you can basically take any, I've heard this before with project managers, like whatever you think the estimate is, just times it by two. So you got some cushion, right? So you basically put in a padding factor to all of your tasks to account for uh, the unknowns. And you can use a padding factor of two or three or even four if you're really uncertain. So, but the, the problem with that approach, the challenge you hit immediately there is that your stakeholders will want to understand, well, how did you get to this estimate, right? How did you, how did you come up with this estimation of the date? And you'll explain to them like, oh yeah, we took up all the tasks and then we don't know what we don't know. So they're going to say, well, you know, well, what can you do to, you know, shrink down that, that padding factor, right? But the kicker there is that you can't figure out what you don't know until you start doing the work to figure it out. So the only way to get to figure out what you don't know is to begin doing the work and mm -hmm. thus you're actually going to complete the project in order to, to know all, figure out all the unknowns you essentially have to complete the project so there's a really high cost in you know basically tracking down those unknowns so i think just being able to explain that to your stakeholders that unveiling all those pesky unknown tasks only happens when you roll up your sleeves and dig into the known tasks so it's important that you put a time back time box around your your estimates so that your decision makers understand like yeah I, I we spent two weeks on this I I understand that you you maybe not comfortable with this with this padding factor but it's the reality of software development do you do you ever, have you ever had those types of conversations with decision makers or do you just try to obfuscate the padding factor away from the estimates Nicole or do you have a totally different approach that doesn't even follow this line of thinking. No, I think what you said makes sense. Um, I definitely have had those conversations where when you give estimates that you feel are realistic, they are scary high and then they have you have to kind of like back into a different estimate, which ends up probably being less accurate or you're just cutting away a bunch of, you know, the scope or mm -hmm. trimming down the feature set. Um, another thing that I struggle with that you described is even getting to that point of having the story map or all of the, the tasks is a lot of time spent with the engineering team. Um, you you know, you're in these refinement sessions trying to break down the tasks and, and understand how many tickets, because uh, to your point, I, I agree, like looking at it at a, at a ticket total is best than story points just because like how many tasks are there, it'll average out. I think that's cleaner, but getting to that number is, is challenging. So what I've tried to do sometimes successfully, sometimes not, is break the project into milestones and then just focus on those and like trying to oh. splice it into really simple pieces. And basically then at that point deciding, do we continue the project? Are customers receiving it well? Is it getting the, are we going in the right direction? Should we keep building this? Should we stop? Should we, you know, instead of going in some projects, that's much harder. Like maybe you can't really release a, an MVP that's truly that minimal because it just requires 
requires so many like system changes or whatever, like maybe you can't do that. So it's just, it kind of varies project to project. But the thing that I found is just like having transparency with all of your stakeholders and, and people involved in the project and constantly checking in and when your estimates are changing is really like the best that we can all do. And I think what they, all they can really, you know, realistically expect from us not that we're going to hit every date but that we're just in sync on what the plan is and if it's changing so if if we're a week away and then i say oh it's going to take us another month you know ideally i'd I'd rather not be in that situation where we're already ahead of it and knowing like how far away we are and and seeking on that so i i i kind of think maybe this is a hot take but i kind of think everyone knows that we're all just guessing but at least like we're all on the same page about what the current state of the situation is (laughs) So, uh, which is difficult in a company when you have a lot of stakeholders, a lot of departments, keeping everyone in sync all the time as things are constantly in flux is very challenging. Yeah. Yeah. I like the idea of the milestones. So even if you have, um, you know, a long project that's going to take several months or, you know, who, who knows how long having, having some milestones identified helps illustrate progress, right. And show like we hit, we, you know, we, we made it through this one milestone. So we're moving on to the next piece. Um, so I talked a little bit about, you know, doing those accuracy, ac- accurate, doing estimates based on that task and the padding factor. Um, so the second part of the methodology that I studied is um, looking at your precision precision with each task. Um, so with each task, you kind of have your normal case where this is like your business as usual. You've accounted for the usual hiccups and roadblocks and you you expect to see you basically have a 50-50 shot of of getting this task done of when you when you say you will. Um, that's your normal case. Mm-hmm. So, like, if you think the task is going to take, let's just use days uh, for now because I don't want to really want to get into um, pointing for tasks. But, like, say it's going to take us, you think it's going to take three days. That, that would be your normal case, and that means you basically have a 50-50 shot of hitting that three days. Um, then you have your best case scenario where it's, like, you know, everything lines up and the code wrote itself and you, you had chat gpt you know write the function for you and it just worked out I... the gate and um so that's your best case scenario and maybe it takes like you know half a day so that would be like your you, there's a 99 there's a one percent chance that you're going to hit that best case scenario for that particular task and of course on the flip side you've got the worst case scenario for the task um, which is everything that could go wrong. We call it the Murphy's Law estimate. Everything that could possibly go wrong for this task goes wrong. And so that's your your 99% chance, um, you know, is your, your t- you're talking 90%, 99% chance of overshooting this one. Um, so basically only once in 100 times would you, would you miss that worst case scenario. Um, so what we're getting at here is you basically are developing a probability distribution for each task, right? So you have your best case scenario, your normal scenario, and your worst case scenario. Um, and, and then you can take that, take all those. Um, so you do that for each task, right? And then you would take those and you would basically calculate um, your, your, your mean task estimation, which we talked previously about you know, accurate estimates, and then you would actually calculate your standard deviation for the entire subset of tasks. And then that gives you a, basically a range of dates, a range of probabilities. So when you talk to stakeholders about when a project is going to be done, um, you should av- always avoid giving a, a specific date and you should talk about your range of probabilities. Like, you know, your if everything falls within our normal development expectations, you know, we have a 50% chance of hitting that mean task estimation estimate. If everything goes perfectly, you know, we hit this uh, best case scenario, um, you know, that would be, there's a 1% chance that we'd get it done at that best case scenario probability. And so that was an interesting way to look at project estimation for the, the research I did at this show. I've never seen it done like that. Um, and it's actually been around for um, quite a long time. It's called the, um, it's this, this estimation uh, approach was 
born from the Polaris Fleet Ballistic Missile Program in the 1950s. And it's mm -hmm. called PERT, which is short for Program Evaluation and Review Technique. Um, it's been used by thousands of organizations to, you know, estimate complex projects that have a lot of unknown variables. So, yeah, that was kind of, um, you know, I've been in software for a long time. I've never seen it done like this, but this is a, I'm a big fan of Robert Martin, who is uh, one of the founders of the Agile methodology and the solid principles. And this was a, I watched a video series where he talked about estimating software projects and this was the essence of it. So. Yeah, sorry my, for my long rant. Yeah, no, my I take on that kind of goes back to what Nicole said, right? Is is breaking it down into milestones, and I think you with software, it's a little different, especially if you can, you know, push out changes. It's a, it's a web app; you can push out the changes. It's not a, you know, a desktop app that's um, a little harder to to upgrade, to update. Um, so I think it's a little different. You know, I, I, I think there's a place for that project planning and estimations on that bigger scale for a lot of things. Uh, but with software, you want to try to break it down to as small a piece as you can. And, you know, if there is a, you know, big feature, whatever that you're working on and they're setting the date, figure out why why is that date set, right? Is it a marketing thing? Uh, that's usually what it comes down to when, when I've dealt with that is, you know, they want to have a date and they want to market it. And if you, you know, and that's traditional, like traditional with other things, you know, you have a release date for a product and you're pushing it out. But if you, you know, some of the best advice out there when doing software isn't to, isn't to do it that way, right? Is to, to market it before it even comes out, um, to get beta users. So that would never really was a, you know, a good reason. So it, my advice is to push back, you know, why is there that date for the big thing uh, and try to break it down as much as possible into uh, into little things that can be released, uh, whether it's just, you know, asking, hey, what do you want, right? The feature is just a button that just asks the user, what, you know, what do you want to, you know, what would this feature look like to you? And if we made it, you know, do you, do you want to pay for it now, right, is, is the best thing to do. That's my little take on that, that I've thinking about as you're going over this. What are your thoughts on that, Nicole? Yeah, at, at Meetup, um, they really heavily encourage us to do painted door tests and try to, you know, validate as quickly as possible. On my team, I haven't, I, I've actually worked on some media projects so far in my first two quarters at Meetup. So I haven't been able to quite take that on yet, but we've been talking about it a lot for Q4 of like, how can we validate these ideas without fully building a, even a solution just to see if there's interest. So I, yeah, I, Especially in, in in a case where you have maybe like limited engineering resources or um, a lot of competing projects, you you really have to be creative about how you spend your engineering time, and so it's it's it kind of becomes essential to do that, think in creative ways like that, and not spend six months on every project because you just you don't always have the the allocation to do it. Yeah, I I like the approach um, with projects of you kind of have to get enough planning in place to get started. I think at least in my the projects that I've worked on specifically like sitting around for weeks at a time planning every nuance of a complex project I just feel like your plan only you know it kind of falls apart as soon as there's initial contact right so you really just need enough to get started and then have frequent iterations and check-ins to make sure you're kind of staying within bounds and scope of what you're trying to ultimately achieve. And that works well. Like when we talk to customers from the consulting world, like um, it's very challenging to like scope out a major, you know, cloud infrastructure project, right? Like accurately, you know, modern modernizing a, a legacy application, you know, so we we t we usually talk in terms of um, fixed capacity and variable scope. So we're going to staff a project at a certain level for a certain duration. We know that from based on experience, the scope is going to change as soon as we start in that first sprint. You know, scope is going to just change. So really, we're just thinking about from a consulting perspective. It's more about the outcomes and the customer. Um, expectations, right? Are they happy with the work we're doing? Did we did we achieve the objectives that they we set forth, or you know, some version of those objectives? So, yeah, 
right? Focusing on the outcomes and the value you're delivering versus the date you're hitting because mm -hmm. it kind of doesn't matter if you hit a date or don't hit a date if you built the wrong thing. Yeah, exactly. But, so I, I've never sat in a product manager's chair and said like where you've had to like deliver a large feature that might take like that to me seems like some semblance of a plan, but I just, to me, it just seems really challenging to, to plan all that work out for six months. And the amount of, I feel like the longer it's going to take you to do something, the more unknowns are in there. So you increase your padding factor in order to account for that. And uh, what I've struggled with there is that the reason the project ends up taking that long is because it is a large project, surely, but it's because the company has other needs that that are not going to stop, right? So you have injections, you have bugs, you have small projects that creep up, you have customer requests. So you're constantly juggling this big initiative with all these small projects and there it's always just oh it's a quick thing it's a quick thing it's a quick thing right so you're so when you're doing your estimates i was kind of curious when you said that um the way they modeled it out in like 50 percent of the time your estimates are wrong i wonder if that is factoring in these types of injections or if that's another layer to it because that's where i struggle with the estimates is a lot of times when we look back at it we'll think actually our estimate wasn't that far off if we were spending all of our time on it but obviously we're not because there's no there's no like reality where there aren't in unknowns coming up. Like you could plan a quarter and then a week later you have a bunch of projects that you didn't know about a week before because something changed or some new thing came out or whatever. Like it's ever evolving. So that's, yeah. that's the problem I have with estimates It's is it's not necessarily that the engineering estimates are like wildly wrong, but we don't really know how much time each sprint we're going to have. You know, you may have a, an outage, you may have a fire drill, you may have a cus really important customer come to you and say, I need this done, or maybe an, a, a, a stakeholder needs something. Like, it's just, it's tough. It's a tough joke. Yeah. Sure. I think the the um, the perk model assumes that you're kind of in a vacuum, right? Like you have a team that's focused on the task at hand and it doesn't account for all those shifting priorities and shiny objects and bugs and compliance emergencies and security alerts and all that jazz. So I, I do okay. think it's like, I, th I think that I just posted, um, I'm working on a blog, I wrote a blog post for what I covered here and I wanted to put the formulas in the chat there, but that's kind of like the breakdown of how you actually do the formulas, pretty basic standard deviation. When you look at mean task es estimation, it's two times the normal case plus the best case, plus the worst case divided by two, all divided by three. Um, <laughs> sounds confusing, but it's actually pretty simple math. And that gives you like your your mean task estimation. Um, and I don't think it accounts for all those other variables that you had. So I think you'd have to basically to account for all that stuff you said, Nicole, you'd have to go, you know, three times your normal case or four times your normal case to account for mm. all the injection work that all the unplanned work, basically. Right. Uh, I, I've also heard of like look comparing it to other projects you've done. I think that's kind of harder to do in practice because nothing, if you know, nothing is like exactly the same. But how many tickets did it take you to create this feature, and is this a similar size? And you know, expect that many tickets, and how long did that take? I, I don't know. I mean, I've had varying success with that, but it's. I feel like the larger the project, when you get into the the t-shirt size, large, extra large, it's your your estimates are almost certainly going to to keep changing because you just don't know what you don't know. Yeah. And you, you don't know what the other teams have to do, especially when it's that large and complex, right? There's multiple teams involved that right. could have different, you know, shifting priorities and, and things like that. Um, I do want to shift to avoiding traps by the other, you call them stakeholders, management. It could be just other people on your team, but I think the important thing to remember is that you have to be honest with your estimates um, and be able to explain to decision makers why your estimates are what they are. It's the role of management to basically conduct the orchestra of uncertainty, right? Their job is to manage the risk. So that means it's their job to understand your levels of certainty and uncertainty. What a common, there's a common tactic, um, that managers like to do is um, they want you to commit to a date, right? When When is this thing going to come out? So as soon as they ask you to commit to a date, they're shifting the risk that they're supposed to manage onto you so that when 
you don't hit your date, you're the one who looks bad. And, you know, they've kind of got um, a ripcord, you know, an escape hatch to say, well, you know, Nicole said it would be this date, but she couldn't deliver again. So what are you going to do? So be wary of that. So, yeah, I, I, if they try to get you to commit to it a date, I, you have to circle back to the estimates and the probability of your estimate and mm -hmm. your, the probability of your milestones, right? I would very reluctant to commit to an actual date. And find out why. Yeah. I dive into that because it might only be part of it, uh, you know, that another team is waiting on or, you know, to, to get that definitive. Is it a number that they just made up or does it have to be that way? You know, is it is it you know, life, you know, altering? Is, there, you know, is it critical? Critical, business, right? yeah. Um, saying yes or no, you know, yes means yes, no means no, right? So when you communicate, like, if you're uncertain, you should art articulate that uncertainty. And it's far better to be upfront than make promises you can't keep. So, yeah, that's one. The domino effects of saying yes. If you say yes and you can't meet the commitment, you can actually cause like a, a cascade of challenges that could cripple the entire project uh, and by extension, the company. So like, even though you might just want to say yes, commit to a date, get out of this awkward meeting, like you have to think like this could have, this has downstream effects, right? It can actually cripple the organization depending on the, the scope and size of your commitment. Just be wary of the word try. You know, can we try to get this uh, by this date? It can basically pull, it's a trick, it's a trick that they can pull you into over committing again, where it's like, well... I hear what you're saying, but let's try to, let's try to get this date. Let's try to set this date and s see how it feels or, you know, something like that. Um, again, it comes back to just communicating the reality of the uncertainty of, of the work you're, you're tasked at, at completing. Those are kind of my, the traps that I had. The one we talked about, which is the cost of increasing your certainty, right? If you want to inch closer to the certainty of your estimate, the only way to do that is to actually roll up your sleeves and start uncovering those unknowns, right? We we talked on that already. So, yeah, my big which, my big which ironically is, takes the engineering team away from the project that you've already estimated from another time, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It's very dumb. Um, I, I I really enjoyed researching for the show. I do think there's there's got, there's probably other ways methodologies I want to look into, but the pert one was I, I thought an interesting approach uh, from from a person that I look to for a lot of uh, professional development, which is that Robert Robert Martin person. So yeah, do they, you know, go into further when you say best case, worst case, right? And in, in defining that? But again, how how big of a project, right? Like missile, right? Building missiles, I could see that. Uh, but like where where do you draw the line? Is it worth it to uh, you know, how how far do you go? in figuring that out yeah because like that's a whole rabbit hole right of like in a time sink yeah um pretty easy to i had an example where it's like you have a, a table where you have to you basically create a table and you have one column's your best case one column's your normal case one column's your worst case and if you're putting it in terms of days you know it's not too bad to kind of I guess I don't. I don't know if I understand your question. Well, how do you? I kind of asked maybe you. Maybe right? so, use from older sprints, like the data you have on how long each ticket takes to get done. I don't know. If yes. Yeah. So that's it. like the first thing I was saying is calculating that best and worst case. That comes down to just guessing. I feel like unless they can really, like, I feel like somewhere in the equation there's some coefficient somewhere that's just a guess, and maybe it's like, hey, this person has more experience, so their guess is weighted higher, right? But like no matter in, you know, wh where in there, there's some some guess somebody's making. Yeah, I think with that, it's like you could do like the the poker game where you, how many how many points is this going to take? And you have to look at, you know, what your senior folks are saying versus what your junior folks are saying. And, um, you know, that kind of gets you to probably something that's your normal average. And then in terms of your best case and worst case, um, you know, your worst case is pretty straightforward in that you you basically do that padding factor and you say, okay, it's going to take us three times as long or and you kind of do the same for your best case, you know, 
I think there's some ways you could streamline it and just, I think you'd have to go through the exercise a few times and understand the velocity of your team and their capability and um, get a feel for how this methodology pans out with a real world project. So when you're doing, I, I want to get kind of circle back to someone who's actually doing the real work in the field, Nicole. So when you're, when you're doing the work and planning, um, you said it's a lot of, a lot of meetings, um, kind of just grinding out estimations. Are, are you guys think, are you guys talking in terms of, do you think when you're estimating, you're thinking about this is our normal case, we got a 50% chance of, of making this? Or are you, are you saying, are you estimating based on a little bit of a padding factor out of the gate to make sure that you're actually going to get it? Well, I definitely don't do the date range uh, perspective. That's in really interesting. We always, uh, we're currently doing everything in terms of single dates and updating them as we go. So I would maybe consider doing more of like a like a plus or minus. Uh, but the way that we do it is like we have basically the project's t-shirt sized and then that helps us kind of roughly plan out a quarter's worth of work. And then as we start to work on each project, the the refinement meetings to create all the tickets to to build that chunk of that work. And then at we have we meet weekly with the stakeholders and have like all the projects listed out and like roughly where we see them targeting to complete. So we know that like the further out the rougher the estimate and then as we're getting closer and closer it should be more and more accurate but I I don't really get the pressure of like this date has to be exactly right it's more just to give everyone kind of a rough idea of what's coming when but if we meet the following week and we say okay now I've updated this date from you know 9 12 to 9 15 this is why you know we're all kind of on the same page and understanding of that I I don't feel like I you know, missed a deadline, so, so to speak. It's more of just trying to keep everyone in the loop. Yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. So it's it's it kind of goes from like t-shirt down to more and more refined as the project goes along. So, yeah. so your estimations are more for like team coordination, right? Like this feature's out so I can work on this now from the front end or this service team can now integrate with that service. Is that more what your estimations are used for or or are they used for marketing release purposes? Uh, that too. Yeah. I mean, we definitely have. So we regularly meet with all the other departments, the data team, marketing, data science, like basically trying to keep in sync with their timelines as well. So if we have a feature that's coming out, we give them our rough timeline and then they start to plan their roadmap based on that. So if they need to do marketing announcements like they have it, but it's constantly shifting. It's like, you know, we're we're just kind of like we're all saying giving our best guess so that they can kind of prepare. But then every time we sync up with them, we're, we're readjusting that guess. So it's the, I was just trying to say that I, I don't feel the pressure that it's like, it has to hit this. It's more just to try to keep everyone in the loop of like where we're, where we're, what we know right now. Do you feel, I don't know how to ask the question. How often are you on delivering things on time? I would or say, you say it's always, is it, is it always shifting because of these, you just have the meetings, the expectations get shifted and Right. Thanks if you go group. based on that original first number, probably almost never. Right. Yeah. What is on time? Right. It, it, does right. the customer yeah. right. have to tell you? Right. Then it's always on time. Yeah. But, uh, I, I mean, the smaller the project, the the less unlikely it is to be wildly off. But um, yeah, it, it when you get into the large size project, large extra large, you know, it's it's inevitable. I think that, and that's when we start trying to break it down into smaller releasable milestones and say like, this is this piece of functioning software will go out and then we'll continue and continue and continue and maybe like you know on the roadmap it's one big goal but we like release it five times or whatever and you talked about uh the t-shirt sizes and planning work for the quarter what are your thoughts on like beyond the quarter we're in is it like a parking lot of ideas or is there actually like some is there a roadmap that goes beyond the current 90 days we're in so far i've really just worked out of uh quarterly planning and then list of backlog of tactics like mm -hmm. you described we have recently started discussing trying to think to the next quarter for the kind of design and discovery phases that are going on in the quarter before it because i think a lot of times what will happen is you'll have these like really great ideas but they're really kind of scary and unknown and it's like we almost don't want to just like commit to it in a quarter until we know like validate it that it's worth building do discovery work maybe do re user research so, uh you know to determine what is this 
piece of this that we can build. So I think doing some of that the quarter before with like your design team, your data, like user research, product management, but then the engineering team, I I wouldn't recommend going beyond a quarter. I, I actually, we've talked about doing like continuous planning where we don't really think of it in terms of quarters, but I think for the leadership team, they still like to have that kind of roadmap of like what's coming and when roughly. So that that's been hard to convince, but ideally I would love to almost just be like a stack rank versus months because as soon as the first one's off, then it's a domino, right? So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've always liked, I've, I've liked the, what can we get done in the, for, in this 90 days approach? The feedback I've heard from executives is that you're kind of avoiding taking on the big challenges, right? Because if something can't fit into, fit nicely into a quarter, you know, it might, it's not worth doing or it's too hard to do. So we're not going to do it, even though it's something that could significantly alter the trajectory of the organization. It, it just seems like it's hard to, I think, but I also think that the problem is that businesses can't commit to something, right? Like they just, like if something takes longer than 90 days, they just, their, their attention span, they just lose their focus and they want to jump to the next easy win. The, ne the next easy win to get a revenue bump versus this big thing that we thought was going to transform the org. That, yeah, that is a, that definitely tricky. And we're very driven by hitting uh, OKRs. And so if if it's a really big, scary project that it could take a lot of time, that's going to, the the denominator of how much money you spent on it needs to make sense. So then it, it, it becomes a harder sell as well. But that's where it comes into like doing the painted door test and like breaking things down of like what how can we like start to chip away at this and validate that this is the right direction? And you mentioned time this is... boxing before. Yeah. Uh, I was just saying that how often do you incorporate that? Do you like in everything that you do, is it time box, you know, or do you kind of leave it, leave it open for that discovery phase and finding out or implementing? Oh, like if it can't be done this time, right? Like that's the, the uh, auto. So was that? How do I you start about it? In, yeah, I don't think about it in terms of like design or product time boxing, I guess. Uh, but for let, let's say we're trying to validate if something is worth doing, we might give a spike ticket to an engineering team and say, you know, kind of poke around in here and see like how hard would it be to do this thing, and like we'll time box that because sometimes we need to know like are we talking about extra large or a medium or a small like what is what would it take for us to even start to chip away at this problem so that those are definitely time box if that answers your question but on the design and discovery like outside of the engineering team i, I haven't thought of it in that way outside of sprints yeah yeah okay close to time here any other thaw questions or topics you guys want to dive into before we sign off here no it's just the time boxing is on my mind i've been recently thinking about that it's just time boxing Everything that I do, I'm just working around the house, because I'll sometimes, Jeez. you know, spend too much time on it. And uh, yeah, just really, really getting into the, the time boxing of this is how much I'm spending on this, right? It's like two sets, right? One to start working on it, you know, for an hour and then figure out how much it's going to take, you know, two more hours, right? Only spending two more hours, you know, get it, get it done. Mm -hmm. Not uh, a bad idea. We did that episode on Shape Up methodology, Nicole. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but that's like a six week cycle for development. Very interesting topic. Um, maybe you can go check out our previous episode, but it kind of led me down this path of like thinking about projects and estimates and I don't know. I just like been doing Scrum and Agile for so long. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to find, I'm trying to see if there's other alternative ways to, to do things um, because I just don't think Agile and Scrum are perfect. So Oh. And it's like yeah, baking I, I, in the I, I, discovery. Yeah. Shape up is interesting in that you um you basically shape the work and then you present it to stakeholders as like this is our these are our prepped projects that are ready to choose from. You can pick and choose any any of these uh initiatives that you want us to run with over the next six weeks and then you kind of just like there's no there's not a lot of stand ups or like all there's it basically reduces all the meetings and the teams just focus on the work for the six weeks and try to deliver that thing they promise they deliver in that in that time box so anyways don't want to go down that rabbit hole no i'll um, check it out yeah um just want to take an opportunity to thank everyone for listening today joining uh in the audience here really appreciate people showing up 
I uh, hope you found the conversation informative and valuable. And i uh, love to have you join again next week where Ray Welker is going to be continuing his Infrastructure as Code series, uh, g- diving into strategies and best practices. Uh, as always, the episode will feature expert guests and interactive conversations, so be sure to tune in. Thank you, everybody.